and uh, I just have a couple of brief announcements very quickly before we get started today. Um, the first, the first one is um, hopefully everyone is now on our email list. Raise your hand if you get our monthly news newsletter. Usually around the first of the month, but up until the sixth. Okay, if you don't, come see me afterward. We'll write down your email address and we'll make sure you get on it because there are always videos or tips or something that's useful in those monthly newsletters, so we wanna make sure that we can get those to you, um, including this first announcement, which has to do with the next Zinberger dine-out. So our next Zinberger dine-out is gonna be August 9th, and all that is is an opportunity to get together, have dinner, get some of your friends, get some of your classmates, and if we come to uh, Zinberger on River and Campbell on August 9th, anytime between five and nine o'clock, they'll donate 20% of the bill back to the Power Gym, okay? So that's gonna be the next dinner night. And then finally, one more announcement is, uh, has anyone heard the radio program Talk of Tucson? No? Okay, good, we got a new audience. So Talk of Tucson uh, is a basically a 30-minute program developed by iHeartRadio that highlights a, a different nonprofit every week. And it plays six or seven times through the weekend on five different radio stations that are all owned by iHeart. And I am excited to announce that Power Gym is gonna be this week's Talk of Tucson program. So um, July 21st and 22nd, is anybody up at six o'clock in the morning? <laughs> I would imagine most of you are, maybe seven. Anytime between six and seven, there's six, six thirty and seven. You can hear that Talk of Tucson program on 93.7, 98.3, 790 AM. I'm gonna repeat all these later, but I'll write them up on the board too. But I just wanted to give you an idea that we'll be on that uh, program this week. And if you can, tune in. Yes. Yes, we'll probably link it. I'm not sure that we'll actually get the audio file, but we will definitely make it uh, either linked from our website or available so that you can catch it afterwards as well, if, if you don't happen to be up. Any other questions before we get started? Okay, then I'm gonna turn it over to Becky Farley and she's gonna introduce our fantastic speaker today. All right, great, thank you all for coming. Um, we're really excited about tonight's topic, so you have, if you don't have a worksheet, I'll go bring them around. I know the three of you are gonna need a worksheet. Anyone else? Um, okay, so I'll make sure that. Um, I'll get them right now. Okay, thank you. Um, and uh, there will be flyers on the back table for our, our next talk, and so they'll be out there, and we'll announce that at the end what our next uh, topic will be. But I'm excited to invite and to, well, to, to actually be able to introduce Nancy Teeter. Um, I met her and I've heard her speak and I know you're, you're gonna love it. And I wanted to read some of her bio because it's really nice. And um, if any of you are looking for someone to be to, as a consultant for nutrition and diet, diet, this is a good person to talk to. So she is a registered dietitian and she has a bachelor's in dietetics from Oregon State University, which we have um, some employees from Oregon. Um, she completed her dietetic internship at the University of California at the Extension there in Berkeley. And she's had 30 years in food and nutrition management. And then she's got a private practice in town. Um, and she does offer consultations emphasizing wholesome foods, integrative wellness, and healthy aging. So she's lectured widely, and I that's when I first um, heard her was at Miraval, where she does some of the talks there. And on different things like gut health, which you're gonna to hear tonight, anti-inflammatory lifestyle, metabolism, blood pressure management, and healthy weight. So she has a real diverse background and can answer a lot of your questions. So we're gonna save your questions for the end. Um, and we have this hand mic, so I wanna, I'll be running around, raise your hand if you wanna ask questions so that everybody can hear it. Um, she has served as the past president of the Arizona Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. And what I really like is she's applied her master, is, can you should listen to this, Master of Organizational Management in her business Ooh. and academic leadership. So we could probably use some of you around here. <laughs> so anyway, enjoy the talk um, and save your questions. And I'm, I know you'll enjoy it. So thanks. Thanks, Nancy, for being here. Well, 
Well, thank you for that lovely introduction. I'm delighted to be here with you this afternoon. I live up in Saddlebrook, and uh, so I'm surrounded by people who are my age, so it's great to see you all here. Um, so I, I really am passionate about this topic, and the reason I'm really, really passionate about it is that it's really relatively new information. The research that supports what I'm going to tell you today took place in the early part of this century. In other words, like around 2012 to 2017. So, I mean, this is new information. And so I find it very exciting to talk about because to some degree, the, the research that this is based on simply substantiates what we've been telling everybody to eat forever. But it also explains a lot of things. And so I'm hoping you'll get a lot of new information out. So I'm glad you, you have the worksheet. The idea was that it uh, gives you a little bit of a summary of what I'm talking about today so you don't have to take really copious notes. But it also gives you a place to write down those things that you want to commit to do for yourself, for your own health. And this topic relates to healthy individuals and people who have some kind of a dis Ease. And um, so it, it applies to everybody, um, not just uh, for, for Parkinson's. And as Becky said, you can just hold your questions until the end, but we have plenty of time for questions. If you need to write them down, there's room on the back of the handout to, to do that. So we'll go ahead and, and get started. And the thing that we're going to talk about today is that we're going to define and describe the microbiome. We're going to have you understand what the roles of the microbiome are and how they influence your health and also what you can do to help your microbiome flourish. So let's start by defining that word microbiome. It is the collection of cells that are in and on your body that are not human. They include bacteria and yeast and some viruses. And you've got them on your skin, you've got them in your nose, and your ears, but you also have them throughout your whole digestive tract. So that is what the microbiome is. And uh, we're gonna be talking about, about that. And, and I find myself personally, I learn better when I don't have to learn new terms. So here's how I look at the microbiome. It's a zoo. Has everybody here been to a zoo? And you can picture walking through and having these different enclosures, these different colonies of animals. And, in, and if they're in a great environment, they'll actually breed and multiply and come up with more zoo animals. Okay, so we're gonna use that analogy today, that what, what is inside you is a zoo. And if we use that analogy, that what's inside you is a zoo, that makes you the zookeeper. So I'm gonna teach you today how to be a good zookeeper. 2,000 years ago, more than 2,000 years ago, Hippocrates died. Hippocrates is credited with being the father of modern medicine, and he left behind a lot of famous quotes, and one of them is, all diseases begin in the gut. Now, science has proved him to be right. So I wanna talk to you about first about your digestive system. And pictured on the slide is, is really what I refer to as the gut, and that is mostly the large intestine, but also the small intestine. And scientists refer to your digestive system as the second brain. And the first thing you need to know about the digestive system is that it's totally independent of the brain in your head. If we separated, the, if we just slash the nerve that connects the brain and the digestive system, your digestive system would still completely operate on its own. And then secondly, it is through the, that, that um, neuron pathway, the gut sends messages to the brain and makes your brain do things, makes you do things. And so there's this gut, it's called the gut-brain axis. I think of it as a two-way highway but recognize that this, this digestive system goes on regardless of what's going on in the brain. And, and that we get those signals going from the brain, from the gut to the brain. 
The other thing I want to tell you about the digestive system is it's really complicated. I mean, it, and it's not only complicated so much as it is amazing to me how well it really works and, and how complex it is. So the small intestine is what is in the center of the, the picture and it is called the small intestine because it's the size of its diameter. If you look at the middle finger on your hand, that's about the diameter of your small intestine. And it's 22 feet long. So it's not small in length, but it is small in diameter. And then the larger tube that you see on the diagram is the large intestine. And it gets its name because it's larger in diameter and it's about five feet long. And the, the majority of your zoo animals live in the large intestine. There's one family of bacteria that live in the small intestine. Um, kind of think of it if you went to a, a zoo and they had a butterfly enclosure. Can you imagine that? And in the butterfly enclosure, everything that's inside is from the same family. But they've all, but there's so many different ones, different colors, different shapes, and even they behave differently. So that's kind of what goes on the small intestine. In the large intestine, it's like the rest of the zoo, except it's a greater diversity than any zoo that you can ever imagine. It's greater diversity than any ecology on Earth. It's pretty complex, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. So what does the, what does the what are the animals in your zoo? How do they influence your brain? They influence your taste receptors, your level of hunger, your level of satisfaction, your moods, your feelings, as well as your behavior. So the things coming out of the second brain affect all that's going on up here. So, I'll talk some more about the amazing zoo because I, I think this, the facts are astounding. 80% of the inhabitants in your zoo are actually health promoting. They're called probiotics. The word means for life. That means the other 20% are not health promoting. They have the potential to cause disease. There are 10 non-human cells on and in your body for every single cell that you have in your body. This collection, this microbiome, accounts for four pounds of your body weight. The number of zoo animals in your colon outnumber the number of people on Earth. There are trillions of them. That's why I'm kind of, this is a big zoo. <laughs> There are, and there are 10,000 microbial species. They fall in the gut, they fall into six families. But within those six families, there's 10,000 microbial species. And within those species, there's an unlimited number of strains. The population size and diversity of your zoo can change in three days. What you do can change it in three days, to the good or to the worse. The colonies in your gut have a circadian rhythm. And for those of you who are not familiar with that term, you as a human being have a circadian rhythm. You want to be awake and alert and, and moving around when it's light, and you want to rest or sleep when it's dark. And the, 